so I hope you've had a good day today so far, um, crammed in the sessions. Um, but I, I thought I'd, many of you might not know me, so I thought I'd just introduce myself a little bit, tell you a little bit about myself. My name's Paul. Um, I was born and raised in Spain to a Norwegian father and an English mother, so naturally grew up a little confused. Um, I then went to Dubai, lived in Dubai for five years, um, which was just amazing. I loved it as a kid. It's just like space. It's great. Um, and then when I was uh, 12, I moved to England. I don't know why. I was in the warmth, and they just... <laughs> Derby as well. I mean, near Nottingham. It's just... It's cold, man. It's not, I, don't, I don't really know why. But anyway, um, and then I stayed there for a few years. Um, I until I was 18, and I, I started um, acting. I started uh, uh, getting a, a, a want for the art. So uh, I, I auditioned for some drama schools. I was uh, lucky enough to be accepted into one of the most prestigious ones uh, in the world, called the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. Um, there I met my incredible wife, Faith, over there. Um, <laughs> who is like just such an incredible actress. If you haven't seen her perform, I can't wait until you do, because you will. She is amazing and a talent to behold. Um, but um, I started doing fairly well in my acting career, you know, for, for new actors anyway. I, I did a, like three BBC jobs for like some soaps and stuff like that. And then I did a, a tour in Germany. Not a tour, I mean, just went to Germany. It's not really a tour. It's a one-stop <laughs> one place. But it was a tour for me because it was like, oh, moving. Okay. <laughs> Here I am. All right, see you later. Um, but it was really good. And, and, uh, and when, you know, I was, I was raised as a, as a Christian, I, I, you know, with Christian parents. I found Jesus when I was 18. But my idea was that I had my dreams and ambitions and that God would just help me achieve them. Um, that, that, I mean, I don't really have to tell you that that's not really the case. Um, instead, God decided to change me. He started to change my dreams, my ambitions, my wants, my desires, uh, and then started giving me the vision of how to achieve his will and his desires and his dreams and his ambitions. And it slowly came into um, form in a production company that me and my wife started called Raw Light. Uh, it's a film production company that uh, our tagline is we aim to raw the light of Christ both on and off the screen because um, there just really isn't a film production production company that's Christ-based in the UK. Uh, if you want to find out more, we've got a stall outside. Um, we can watch some stuff. Um, but it's really cool. I'm really excited and, uh, about the stuff that we're doing. But right now, what I've done very, very briefly is I've told you a brief story about my life. Very, very brief. Um, but just on that simple story, you all have had an effect and you all now have decided what you think about me including my joke at the beginning. Funny, I know. Uh, but it's had an effect on you. And now if I was to tell you that I've just recently completed a doctorate in uh, theology on creativity, some of your opinions would change. They would quickly change again when I told you I just lied. I have not completed a doctorate in theology. Um, but I did accidentally kill a pigeon on the way here. Again, a lie. Um, but your opinions change based on the stories that I tell you. And the, the point I'm trying to make is that stories have a profound effect on us. From when you were children and you had stories read to you as a child, they would have um, informed on who your heroes become today. And their stories would have informed what your ambitions, what your dreams, what your wants are in life, and, and, how, and where your belief starts. Uh, also, history is a story. It's even got the word in there. It's a good clue. Um, but it's just a collection of stories about the past. So whether true or false, stories are just stories. We have a thing in, um, in, in politics when, when something goes wrong. Have you heard it? Control the narrative. Yeah, we've got to control the narrative. Because they understand is whoever controls the narrative will have a greater influence on what people believe. They will inform your beliefs, they'll inform what you think, they'll inform your belief system. In fact, they're all we have of each other. All you share with your friends are stories about yourself. You don't share the bad ones, unless it's your pastor and they ask you to. Okay, I did kill the pigeon on the way here. Uh, I didn't, again, please. But stories have a profound effect on us. So I want to propose an idea. The idea is that we are saved by a story. We are saved by believing and submitting to the story 
That God came down, wrapped his flesh as man, as Jesus Christ, lived a perfect sinless life, died and for our sins, was raised to life and ascended back to heaven. That simple story starts our path of salvation. Of course, we have to submit to God as well, but we have to hear that story. It says in Romans 10 verse 9, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But we have to believe that and we can't believe that unless we've heard that. In fact, it's what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and make disciples. How do we do that? By being my witnesses, his witnesses, by telling the story. And that's what the church has been doing. For thousands of years. It's been great. That's what we've been doing. We've been going out and telling the story of the gospel, the good news. News, again, it's just stories. And we've all come to faith through different ways of hearing this story. Because almost as powerful as the story itself is the way it's told. See, some of us would have heard the childhood story at the age of seven and just something connected in us. We just kind of went, yeah, I know that to be true and I, I give my life to it. Some of us would have had to have all the facts laid out, all the science um, mounted up against the historical evidence for the crucifixion and the resurrection. We would have had to have all these information, bits and bobs laid out, the story extracted to make our decision. Still the same story, but repackaged in a different way. Some of us would have just heard a song. We just would have heard Amazing Grace and something just struck us because the story was told in a way that we could just remember it. And at that point, we gave our lives to Jesus because we believed the story. So the history shows us that the church has been good at this. See, uh, have you ever been to one of those old churches with those stained glass windows? I I've slowly grown appreciation for them, um, mainly just because I think they're beautiful, but, uh, but also because they're not just created for art's sake. They tell the story, exactly. Because in those times, people couldn't read. And so because they couldn't read, the church still knew that these people need to know the stories, some of those most simple stories. Here, we'll create a piece of artwork that you can just look at and see the resurrection of Jesus, or see the parable of the sower, or see the lost son, or see these incredible stories that will inform your relationship with Jesus. They got very good at writing hymns, condensing uh, dense theology into uh, poetical rhymes and, and melodies that we could easily remember, that we could take all over the world. Gary talked about the Salvation Army taking trumpets, because they knew that they could just take trumpets onto the street. It's incredible the way they did it. And then when science began to rise, the church knew, okay, we need to be able to step into that realm and battle it on their front. So the apologetics gave rise, and we saw that the scientific and the historical arguments for uh, the resurrection really began to take rise because they knew that the same story had to be told in different ways. But then like always a sentence began to creep in. Into all traditions, into all uh, cultures, into all churches, one sentence that I think is so dangerous to the Great Commission, so devastating to reaching the lost and helping the hurt. This is just the way we do things. I've said it. <laughs> I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have said it at some point. I'm sorry, this is just the way we do things. We let trend, uh, we let the social trends and we let our traditions clash. Which is a shame, really, because when we start saying that, the world doesn't stop and go, okay, church, we'll wait for you. The world keeps on moving. And we're just standing there falling in love with our methodology instead of our heart and our message. There came a point where uh, bands started to use chords, or uh, rather composers started to use chords that the church didn't use, and the church called them demonic. Those chords are of the devil, you cannot use them. Today they make up most of our worship songs. <laughs> Real demonic there, guys. Woo! 
Um, which is a shame, because what if we caught it then? What if we weren't catching up? What if we caught it then? Now we see a lot of people having a problem with certain types of music like rap. I know some artists who are rappers who use the lyrics to proclaim the word of God, but in rap. And some of the churches are still going, no, 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 we can't have that because that is just not the way we do things. The same message, different wrapping paper. And what's more important when you get a gift at Christmas? The paper or the gift? I love the paper. Now, come on, unless you're three, you, I mean, you don't play with a box and, you know, you play with a gift, right? But the church has sometimes just gets lost in that. See, my, my, my friends, uh, people that I know who, who aren't Christian, I know I have some, whew, um, but they're used to a different form of communication. See, it is actually quite weird to sing songs that are like double the length of normal songs. Have you noticed that worship songs are like seven and a half minutes and any other normal song is three? You, you noticed? It's a bit weird to invite someone to come and just like stand with everyone else like just singing like that if you're not a Christian. It's also kind of weird to ask somebody to sit down and listen to usually an older man speak for 30, 40 minutes about a monologue on some small passage of a big book. It's weird. Like it, it's fine for us because we're used to it, but it actually is really weird. And yet we just, we, we assume that that's the way that they have to hear the word. That's the way they have to listen to the message. What's great, though, about making sure that we remember that it's a story is that the world loves stories. Goodness me, they love stories. And let's, just for a second, let's forget about fairy tales and fables and campfire stuff. I'm just going to go through some statistics, okay? Fun, right? Oh, numbers. But um, Netflix has got 130 million users. Probably over that. This is from 2016. So, yeah, over that. Uh, YouTube has got 1.8 billion logged in users. That's not even people who are just visiting. Uh, the, 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 the global cinema in 2016 brought in $38.6 billion and uh, global television is worth over $100 billion. Let's not pretend the world has turned off their ears to stories. They love stories. And we claim to have the greatest story ever told. So my challenge is to unleash the creative. There are people in your churches, in your ministries, in your lives, who have a gifting like no other. They can't preach, they can't teach, they can't, uh, I don't know, lead or whatever, but goodness me, they can perform a piece of dialogue that will bring your congregation to tears. They will be able to do a piece of poetry that suddenly that... 26-year-old person will just click into what the grace of God means because they just heard it in a poetical form. But we've limited it to a certain way that we do things. And if we think that God is not in the business of creation, I'd just like to point to the first few words of the Bible, in the beginning God created. And if you think that was over and done there, what are we now made into? We are made into a new creation. In fact, the first person to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the entirety of the Bible is a guy called Bezalel. Bezalel is the one who crafted the tabernacle, the ark, and the, uh, the, the uh, priestly garments. First person to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? To create art to bring people closer to God. David, another one. He was an artist. He was a musician. You want another one? There is Ezekiel. Talk about long plays. I got shown this by Hugh the other day. I just blew my mind. So Ezekiel did that drama. He did like he stopped talking because just mine was quite effective. So he was like, oh, you guys just aren't listening. I'm just going to act it out. And he just acted out the siege of Jerusalem. But the, the, my favorite bit was when it said, then he lay down on his right side for 130 days. That's just act one. No intermission. Like, that's crazy, right? God is in the business of creativity. Paul talks about in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, verse 3 to 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. As the church, 
And rightly so. This is not a condemnation. We've become very, very focused on meat. Getting people to the meaty stuff and being able to get the meaty, hearty bit of the message. But we're kind of forgetting about the people who need the milk. The people who just need it just a little bit, just to just be able to catch your appetite, to wet it, to just communicate it in a simple way and slowly then bring them into the meat. Faith and I um, went on a mission to Uganda a couple of years ago. A year ago? Two years ago? Um, and it was amazing. We were tasked with teaching these two churches how to use drama to evangelize. Um, and one of the pieces that we, we did, which we've now like done over five times with different groups, is a piece that we call Court, uh, which you can watch at the, at the table. And it, it's literally just a physical theater piece, no words, it's to music, um, about being caught by the grace of God. We did that, and the, and the one thing that keeps on recurring whenever we do it, excuse me, is that people come up and they say, not everybody, but some people come up and say, I didn't need the sermon, I needed that. Because some people, I'm sorry preachers, aren't ready for your sermon. Some people aren't ready to listen to 40 minutes of your exegesis on Habakkuk. <laughs> I'll be honest with you guys, I've never read it. <laughs> I'm getting there. My Bible in a year is taking me a couple of years, but... Use the creative because it'll reach people that you've never been able to reach before. If you're honest, if you're really wanting to reach people. But my final challenge is this. Don't just use the gifts. See, what happens with creatives quite a lot, I was talking to, to um, uh, Gary about it. We're, we're, quite, we're inherently quite arrogant, um, defensive, um, kind of artsy-fartsy, you know, all this stuff about those, you know, I love it. Yeah, I know you're a lot. <laughs> you're terrible. But what tends to happen with the creative is we, we use the gifts. But if they are on the same platform as the preacher, communicating the same message as the preacher, then to me, as Pastor O talked about a royal priesthood, which is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, applies. They are ministers they are ministering to some of your congregation that you cannot reach. So please don't just use their gifts, but nurture them as you would any minister. Give them the time, the discipling, the mentoring. We ask the band to come in early and play a load of songs and then just dismiss them. Have you checked in with them recently? It's important because they will get uninterested and they will leave. Don't use them. Partner with them. Unleash the creative. Because if we are saved by the greatest story ever told, let's not be afraid to tell it. <laughs>